put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 17. A woman rides the beast. Now we all know from the symbolism in the Bible that a woman is a church and a beast is a political system. So we want to see who this woman is who has the golden cup in her hand and what the beast is that she is riding or who the beast is. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that sits on many waters. Now waters are nations, multitudes, peoples, kings. We get that definition straight from the Bible, from the book of Revelation. So she sits on many nations. This woman controls the nations of the world. Now there is only one church that qualifies for all of these features. Revelation 17.2 says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now the wine is false doctrine, and the false doctrine has permeated throughout the world, and often unbeknown to those who have received it, they are living out a doctrine which is not biblical. Now the kings of the world are all in liaison with this woman according to the scriptures. So if we look at the papal system, we will find that this is precisely what is happening at that level. The papacy also being a political entity, it has its political representatives all over the world, and the leaders of the world, one after the other, have their liaisons with this moral superpower and its morality will be implemented on a worldwide scale. So here we have Gorbachev with the previous Pope. Here we have Fidel Castro with the Pope. The kings and the queens of this planet, they all have their opportunities to come into council with this church power. The Prince of Wales also with the papacy together with uh, Dr. Robert Runcie, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And if we look at the Eastern world, everybody gets an opportunity to have this liaison. Ronald Reagan, who started the liaison and actually uh, created an ambassadorial position to the Vatican. The leaders of Britain, the United States, the East, the leaders of Europe, all of these kings are depicted together with this system. All of them in this liaison. Revelation 17.3 So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman, that is a church, sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Now the scarlet colored beast, the only other place where we have a scarlet colored beast is in Revelation chapter 11 and 12 where we have this depiction of this beast that arises out of the bottomless pit, this political entity. And this woman sits upon it controlling its actions and its motives. We are also told that it is a blasphemous power full of the names of blasphemy. We've dealt with it in previous lectures, so we can just briefly skip over it. Revelation 13, 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. There we have the parallel text in Revelation 13, which describes the little horn power, the papal system. In Daniel 7.25, he, the little horn, speak great words against the Most High. It's the same power as we pass through the book of Revelation, getting more and more detail as we go along. Now this blasphemy, what does it comprise of? We've dealt with it in previous lectures, so let's briefly have a look. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. John 10, 33. 
The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the Vicar of God, Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. So here we have a fulfillment of one of the blasphemous attributes. Forgiveness of sins. Luke 5, 21, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins except God alone? Luke 5, 24, But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your cot, and go to your house. Jesus is the only one who had the power here on earth to forgive sins because he was God in the flesh. But the church has no power to forgive those sins. The priest has the power of the keys, the power of delivering sinners from hell, of making them worthy of paradise and of changing them from slaves of Satan into children of God. And God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon dignity and duty of the priests. A Roman Catholic source. So here we have a system that qualifies in terms of the biblical definition of blasphemy. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. In Roman Catholicism, other mediators are interpolated between God and man. And this is, of course, contrary to the biblical injunctions. Here we have one of the pictures. This one comes from a monastery in Rome where we see Jesus placing the crown of thorns on Mary's head. She becomes the redemptrix, the co-redemptrix. It is as if she had suffered the pain. She has the holes in her hand and receives the crown of thorns. So there is a transference of the mediatorial role. Where does this mother and child image come from that is used in Catholicism? Is it something new? Is it something Christian alone? No, it is not. We find it in all the religions of ancient times and some of modern times as well. So, for example, in India, we have Isi and Iswara in the in the Eastern mythologies, we have Shing Mu and the, the Divine Child. In Egypt, we had Isis and Osiris. And in the Hittite culture, we had also the mother and child aspect. These come from the legend of Semiramis, who received and bore a child after her husband had died. Nimrod, who later was transferred into the Osiris Godhead. It is interesting that the Madonna is depicted as black as well as white. This is the concept of the yin and the yang. And if we go back into the mythologies, we will find that Osiris is also depicted as black or as white. And Isis, the same thing. So these come from the ancient mythologies which can be traced back all the way to Nimrod and Semiramis in Babylonian times. So it is actually a Babylonian religion. That is why it's called the wine of Babylon. Here we have the pictures and the statues of the crowning of Mary as the Queen of Heaven. Now the Queen of Heaven originally was Isis. And even in modern times, this crowning ceremony is often fulfilled. Here we have Pope John Paul II crowning Mary as the Queen of Heaven, almost becoming a fourth person in the Godhead. In Roman Catholicism, we often find Mary depicted in a cave setting. The ancient deities all came out of a cave. Here is the goddess Amaterasu. She emerges out of the cage in a Shinto ritual dance. And the depictions show the ancient deities coming out of these earth structures. So Catholicism has taken this over. In 1854, Mary was declared immaculate by Pope Pius IX. That means she was born without original sin. So Jesus has its merits from his mother and his mother is therefore 
the ultimate projection of perfection without sin. In 1951, Pope Pius defined and enforced the doctrine of the bodily assumption of Mary. These are all parts of this doctrine which emulates the Babylonian mythology. Catholic layman, July 1856, says, The sinner that ventures directly to Christ may come with dread and apprehension of his wrath. But let him only employ the mediation of the virgin with her son, and she has only to show that son the breasts that gave him suck, and his wrath will immediately be appeased. Jesus is portrayed as a wrathful deity, and Mary is the wrath subduer. This is the same as the Babylonian concept. If we have a concept of Jesus Christ as a wrathful deity, then it negates the biblical teaching of the New Testament of the kind and gentle Jesus who was not willing that anyone should die but that all should come to repentance and have eternal life in him. Here is the movement to have Mary elevated to the status of deity. This is Focus magazine in Germany, Weibliche Gottheit. In other words, a female goddess is now being placed into the heavenly Godhead. Maria soll Göttin werden. In other words, Mary must become a goddess. These are fascinating moves and totally contrary to any biblical concept. Here in the right we have the original picture of the dogma of Mary's assumption to heaven. Statements on Mary by Catholic saints. He who falls and is lost who has not recourse to Mary. Mary is called the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. The way to salvation is open to none otherwise than through Mary. The salvation of all depends on their being favored and protected by Mary. And these statements go on and on and on. He who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. Our salvation depends on thee. God will not save us without the intercession of Mary. These come from Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast, page 438. Here we have the evidence that this is Babylonian wine which is sold to the nations as gospel truth. Another form of Babylonian wine, wine we find in Matthew 6 verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. When we have a relationship in prayer with God, we speak to God as to a friend, but not in ritual religion. There you often have beads and you repeat prayers, like a mantra, one after the other, repetitive prayer, something which the Bible condemns. Because we are supposed to have a relationship with God that is intimate. Revelation 17, 4 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It is the Roman Catholic Church alone that has a woman with a golden cup as its symbol. Here is the statue of that woman with a cup in her hand in St. Peter's in Rome. And she has scarlet and purple. What are the colors that are worn by the priests and prelates and popes of that system? Purple and scarlet. The previous pope in red, the present pope in purple. Here is another picture of red and purple. The assistance, the direct assistance of the pope wear purple and the papacy is often arrayed in scarlet and gold and very many precious gems and metals. There's also the medal that is struck where they have the woman with the golden cup on it. This is the Vatican medal or coin, City del Vaticano, and underneath we have the words Fides. Now Fides comes from fidelity. Albert Mackey 
was the 33 degree mason states that the right hand has in all ages been deemed an emblem of fidelity and our ancient brethren worship deity under the name of fides or fidelity which was sometimes represented by two right hands joined and sometimes by two human figures holding each other by the right hand. Numa was the first to erect an altar to Fides under which name the goddess of oaths and honesty was worshipped. Obligations taken in her name were considered as more inviolable than any others. So fascinatingly we have this female aspect in this religion and the name Fides which in the mysticism is used as an emblem for the goddess of oaths. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends says 2 Timothy 4 verse 4 and this is precisely what we have in this system. Sadly most of the people involved in the system have no idea of all of these things. And if only the Bible were central to their teachings, then none of this would have happened in the first place. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, Psalms 116 verse 13. That is the only cup that we are to drink from, the cup of salvation. But unfortunately there is this system in the world, Revelation 17 verse 5, and upon her forehead was the name written mystery. It's a mystery religion. It comes from the mysteries of the past, the hidden things. Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Many, many organizations have drunken some aspect of this wine. We need to get back to the Bible and the Bible alone. The papacy is the one system on this planet that can be all things to all men. Because whatever ritual or pagan incultation there is, they can incorporate it in their worship style. Pope John Paul II being anointed with the sign of the tilak, kissing the Quran, all religious systems can be embraced. There is nothing wrong with good dialogue, but we cannot give up religious principles for the sake of such dialogue. The Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared the way for a religious new world order. A religion which makes Jesus Christ less than he is, the divine saviour, the only way whereby we can be saved, is a religion which is not biblically based. A general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all, that seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. These are the words of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a Jesuit, and represented the church at the level of the United Nations. He writes this in Christianity and Evolution. Now the problem is, once that Christ satisfies them all, he cannot be what the Bible says about him, namely the only way whereby we can be saved. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 4 that they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him. So if we look at this powerful religious political system in the world and we go to the main church which is St. John's Lateran, we will find an interesting inscription on the outside. It says here basically that this system is the mother of all the churches. So again the biblical injunction that she is the mother of all the others comes to the fore very clearly. On the altar inside that church they have the phoenix rising out of the ashes. So we again are led back to the ancient Babylonian mysteries. 
Isaiah 47 verse 8 says, Therefore hear now this, thou art given to pleasure that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thy heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as widow, neither shall I know loss of children. So on the opposite side to the statue of the woman with the golden cup, in St. Peter's, we have the woman with the children clinging to her, the mother church and all her children. No wonder that the present Pope, when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote the following, Other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. It must always be clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all the churches. So this is very plain. The Bible clearly depicts this woman as the mother of all the others that have drunken also, at least partially, of the wine of Babylon. And it is a mystery religion because all the ancient mysticism is involved and incorporated into its dogmas. So she sits upon the mysteries which emanate all the way from Babylon. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. If our religion is not based on this mystery of godliness, but seems to make it less than it is by introducing other mediators or reducing the role of Jesus Christ, then we have a religion that is not biblical. And we have to get back to the biblical basis of our religion. So the wine of Babylon. We've seen some aspects of this wine and uh, we can trace this wine all the way back to the ancient religions. Here's the temple of Baal. And Baal worship was also known for many of these doctrines and dogmas that we find in the churches today. Here in Babylon at that Baal temple there is a woman with a cup in her hand. So this is an ancient symbol that has been taken over. In the book Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike he writes at the bottom on page 292, that the vestments of the priests of Horus, the vestments of the priests of Horus were covered with these crosses. And then he shows a Maltese cross. And if we go to the papal system, then we find that they make use of the Maltese cross in many, many of their regalia. Here we have a depiction of Dagon, the sunfish, clearly display with fish attire and mitre. And the mitre on the head is like a fish. Originally they had the fish cape. Here are the ancient priests of Baal who are spreading holy water. And they also have a fish mitre on their heads. So the ancient gods were Bel, Meradoch, Ninus, the sun or Tammuz, Rhea, Ishtar, Astarte, Beltis, the queen of heaven. Astarte was known as the wrath subduer. In Egypt it became Isis and Osiris. In India, Isi and Aswara, Shing Mu and the holy mother and son. Greece, it was Irene and Plutus. Rome, Fortuna and Jupiter, Pure. So this ancient religion is the same in another form with another name with other names that we find in Catholicism. This is the Basilica San Clement, which we find in Rome, one of the ancient pagan churches over which a modern a Christian church have been built. At the bottom we find an altar with the pagan inscriptions of Mitraism on it. And here we have the god Mitra in the British Museum. And many of the rituals of Mitraism are found within this system. In fact, the church says, Christianity became the established religion of the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism. So all of these ancient rituals were taken over 
by the church. It has often been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great god Pan is not really dead, he is baptized. This comes from the story of American Catholicism, page 37. So if Pan is not dead, then he must be in another form within the system. Many, many of the ancient pagan customs are virtually unchanged within that system even today. For example, the sun door or the door, the gateway to heaven was part and parcel of ancient religions and we find it also in Catholicism. So in the Jubilee, Pope John Paul II blessed the Holy Door on New Year's Day at the Church of Santa Maria. And uh, these same rituals have no basis in the Bible. The ancient pontiffs were carried ritualistically through the streets or to their point of activity. Normally there were feathers, etc. involved as we would find it in Egypt and other places in ancient religions. And the papacy has had this same ritual in its ranks. Of late it has not been used, but it has been part and parcel of the system. The use of halos does not stem from the Bible. It comes from ancient religions. So we'll find it in Catholicism, We'll find it in the Eastern religions, the halos around the head, the triple crown, the signs that are used by the hands. We will find it in Eastern religions. We will find it in Catholicism. The eye of Osiris, we will find it on Egyptian temples. We will find it in ancient times and we will find it in modern Cathedrals. Here is an eye in a sexagesimal triangle in the confessional of a cathedral of Milano in Italy. Venus was born from the sea in a large shell, symbol of the cosmos. So we'll find the same activity and worship of female deity in the symbolism of Roman Catholicism. Here's the pagan symbol of the cosmos on a Roman Catholic crest in St. Peter's Basilica of Rome. If we go to the main altar, the main altar has serpentine pillars and the floor is in a circle as it was in the ancient mystic religions. Signs and symbols of sun worship are found everywhere throughout the system. The pine cone or staff, symbol of Osiris, Egyptian Museum, to Reno. So the pine cone, symbol of fertility and power of regeneration. We find it here in a Hindu god's image, the pine cone in his hand. And of course, the pine cone is also found on the bishop's staff of the papal system. So all of these come from ancient times. The dragon on a papal crest in the Vatican Museum, which is one of the symbols that was taken over directly from Rome. All of these symbols are described in the book of Revelation and they fit only to this one system. Here we have an Assyrio-Babylonian altar depicting the wheel of the sun. Eight spokes, the symbol of sun worship. Here we have the same solar wheel in the temple of Karanak in India. And the same solar wheel we have in the Vatican Square with the Egyptian stella at its center. So again, all the pagan symbols are to be found within the pontifical system. When it comes to idolatry, the Bible says we should not make images, we should not bow down to them. The ancient religions, they bowed down to them, and we find that the papacy does exactly the same thing. So this is Babylonian wine. Exodus 32, 2-6, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. And he made it a molten calf, 
And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Jehovah. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now what does this mean that they rose up to play? Well, when we look at some of the ancient games that were played, we will find that these have been taken over in modern times. So polo was known to the Persians and restored to its original sun game significance by Akbar. Scoring a goal with the sun ball was equated with the triumph of light over darkness, good over evil. The ball is a sun symbol in all such sports as football, hockey, basketball and cricket. The sun game of polo was actually played with an ignited sun ball. Now, it is fascinating that if we look at the ball, we'll find that many modern sports use exactly the same symbolism. Baseball is related to the sun in the sundial shape and pattern of the field, as well as its rules of play and scoring. Like all sports, baseball also embodies the sun's seasonal cycles in much the same way as ancient ceremonial contests were held as part of fertility rites. This comes from the sun in myth and art in UNESCO. So even at this aspect of our society, all of these ancient customs have been incorporated. The Sumerian Gilgamesh story inscribed in cuneiform tablets narrates how the sporting equipment, a stick and a ring or a ball, which Gilgamesh had carved out of an uprooted tree, had fallen into a netherworld as he began oppressing his people by repeated athletic competitions and how eventually it was the sun god who opened a hole in the ground in order to recover them. The Olympic torch, UNESCO informs us, which is the runner, carries to mark the sun's cyclic movements throughout the Olympiad. The four-year period until the next games is also related to the sun's cyclic rhythm. First celebrated in Greece, the games were ceremonial contests in honor of Zeus. Isn't it amazing how in the modern rituals and in the modern games, the ancient pagan culture is being uplifted more and more and more? The sun, moon, other planets, foe, float overhead at the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games. The sun's association with the sport predates the deities Heracles and Apollo in Greece, as it is evident from the epic tale of the Sumerian hero Gilgamesh. So the whole of society has taken up the symbols of Babylon. As in sport, the sun is omnipresent on practically all aspects of life, whether it be art, architecture, philosophy, religion, festivals, folklore, dance, music. Every morning a pagan god of the day wakes us up for the Romans in the early centuries of the Christian era, named each day after the seven planets, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. And of course, Sunday is the ultimate pagan worship day for the sun god. And Roman Catholicism has replaced the Sabbath with the Sunday. Western Watchmen in 1914 declared that Protestantism is not a religion, never was a religion, and in the statues found in Roman Catholicism, the church as mother, as depicted over here, is seen vanquishing her enemies, such as Calvin and Luther, who said the Bible and the Bible alone. This battle raged in the beginning and this battle will rage at the end of time again. We will have to restart the Reformation if we want to go back to the Bible and the Bible alone. At the Council of Trent, it was called by the Pope Paul III from 1545 to 1563. Protestants were present at the meeting, but the Council reaffirmed every single doctrine disputed by the reformers. For example, transubstantiation was disputed because the Bible says that Jesus was sacrificed once for all, whereas Catholicism claims that it is a repetitive sacrifice and that Christ is really present in the bread of the Eucharist. Justification by faith and works, the Bible says we are justified by faith alone. Works are a consequence, not a means to salvation. The medieval mass was upheld 
at that conference. The seven sacraments were confirmed, that there is merit to be gained from a sacrament. There is no merit to be gained from anyone other than Jesus Christ. Celibacy was maintained. Celibacy is an ancient custom dating back to Babylon and has no biblical basis whatsoever. The doctrine of purgatory was maintained, which is something not to be found in the Bible. Indulgences were reaffirmed, where you could buy yourself free from certain punishments in purgatory. And the papal power was increased by giving the Pope authority to enforce the decrees of the council requiring church officials to promise him obedience. Transubstantiation, this comes from Eucharist meditations. Marvelous dignity of the priests in their hands as in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Son of God becomes incarnate. Behold the power of the priest, the tongue of the priest makes God from a morsel of bread. It is more than creating the world. This is Babylonian wine. There is no, no biblical injunction for it. Canon 1 of the Council of Trent, session 13, reads, If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as in a sign or a figure or a force, let him be an anathema. So Protestantism was anathematized. Hebrews 10.14 clearly states, By one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So every time the Mass is read, Christ is sacrificed again and again and again. In ancient religions, we had the symbol of Baal Haddad, which was a sickle moon with the sun inside it, symbolizing the birth of the sun god in the womb. So the moon was the symbol of the female and the, and the sun was the symbol of the male. So we find it in all the ancient religions in Mesopotamia. We find it also in Egypt, the birth of Osiris. And in Catholicism, the wafer is round and it is the divinity and Godhead, so it is a god, and it is placed in a monstrance which has a sickle moon. So this is an enactment of a Babylonian religious activity. On one of the churches in Europe, we find here the sun and the moon, and every time the clock goes round, the Baal Haddad symbol is enacted. Here we find Bonaventure Hinwood's book, More Answers to Your Question, a Roman Catholic source, stating that tradition, infallibility, all of these issues are still active today. The Bible has never been removed from the index of prohibited books as proposed by Pope Paul IV in 1599, of course referring to the Protestant version of the Bible. What about the theology of Jesus Christ being the only name whereby we can be saved? Here is a book written by Professor Paul Netter with the title, No Other Name. He was trained by the Jesuit Karl Rana, who was the one who appointed to expound the doctrines of Vatican II. And he, in this book, presents arguments to say that Jesus is not the only name, but there are many others whereby we can be saved. This is Babylonian wine. In Revelation 17, 6, we read, And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. There is no doubt that millions have died because of the doctrinal enforcing of the dogmas of Rome. Here on the left we have a facsimile of the massacre of St. Bartholomew's, on which night literally thousands of Huguenots lost their lives. The noted Catholic Thomas Aquinas said that convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals. All of these characteristics we find in Catholicism and Revelation 17 
depicts them very clearly. The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted with heresy, she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. Catholic professor Alfred Brudillat, the Catholic Church, Renaissance, and Protestantism. Revelation 17, 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. These are fascinating texts. The woman, of course, the church, which controls the political powers of the earth. The woman as a church is a harlot. That means she is unfaithful to God and the doctrines as expounded in the Bible and substitutes them with other doctrines which are not biblical. Now, what are these stages in its existence? Roman Catholicism has a was stage, an is not stage, and a to come stage. When the papal system received in its political aspect, a mortal wound in 1798, she went into a was not stage. So in 1798 she received a mortal wound and during that period she has been active as a church but not as a political system, at least not openly. In 1854 the dogma of Immaculate Conception was proclaimed 1870, the papacy was declared infallible in 1929. It was declared the sovereign ruler of the world when the wound was healed and the system again received political stature. In 1951, they proclaimed the dogma of the Assumption of Mary and they're currently active with Mary as advocate, mediator and co-redeemer. Verse 9 says, And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, Oros mountain, on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Now heads or mountains in the Bible, as we have said, symbolize empires, not individual kings. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain says the Lord, which destroys all the earth, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks, and I will make thee a burnt mountain. So the kingdom is equated with a mountain. Now let's identify these seven heads. There are a number of interpretations, and each of them have their merits. And I do not wish to be dogmatic, so I'll just briefly go through some of them. Interpretation one. Looking at it from the time of John, the Revelator, the seven heads represent the principal persecuting powers of God's people over the ages. Five have fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. One is Rome, one not yet come, papacy. That's one interpretation. A problem with this interpretation would be that the powers are not all mentioned that have been persecuting powers. What do we do with some of the missing ones, like, for example, the Philistines, etc.? Another interpretation would be that we use Daniel as a template, and some start with Babylon and count from the time of the events portrayed in Revelation 17. So, five have fallen, that would then be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the papacy. One is the wounded papacy in its is-not stage. One is not yet come, the final confederacy under the papacy. The problem about 
with this interpretation is that some of the powers mentioned in the book of Revelation, like the beast out of the earth, which has a very prominent role, are not mentioned at all, except that they perhaps form part of the final confederacy. So it is a pretty good interpretation as far as I am concerned. A further interpretation could be the following. Using Daniel as a template, start with Babylon and count from the time of the events portrayed in Revelation 17. So five have fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, papacy. That is, as a religio-political system, one is the seemingly wounded papacy in its is not yet stayed, a non-religio-political power run by maybe societies arising from the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. The not yet come phase would be the image of the beast, the religio-political confederacy under the lamb-like beast. And the eighth is of the seven, that would be the new world order, the final world confederacy, and the final one world religion that the BBC claimed that Pope John Paul II had prepared the way for. This interpretation would include what the other interpretations embody, but it would also include all the other powers that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. On September 17, 1973, the Club of Rome published a special highly confidential report called the Regionalized and Adaptive Model of Global World Systems. Within this they divided the world up into ten regions which they called kingdoms. In 1974, the authors of the report published their findings in a book, Mankind at the Turning Point. However, in this book, which is intended for public consumption, they have dropped the word kingdom. This comes from en route to global occupation. This is just one interpretation, that maybe the world divided into ten regions will give their power unto the beast to incorporate papal morality into the systems of world government. Revelation 17, 15 says, And he says unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That embodies the whole planet. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman, woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So the Bible predicts that even though the world as a confederacy will give their power to this system to incorporate her dogmas as law on society, the time will come when they will realize, by world events probably, that they have been deceived. And the time of retribution for the system will come, and eventually they will turn on the system. Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the judgment will eventually catch up with the system. So the Bible says it might have power now, but we will have to choose to be faithful to God. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, 
The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21. The second coming is our hope. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. These are the promises that we need to cling to. it. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Even though it may seem that this power has total control, behind the scenes God has absolute control. If we are faithful and we trust the words of the Bible and we trust in the salvation and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear of any of these things that are coming on the earth. We need to pray, we need to get closer to God, and we need to re-establish our religion on the basis of the Bible and the Bible alone. Amen. <music>